Okay, and let's begin. So, uh, by special request, we're going to go over this problem yeah. and then jump into what we want to do today. Um, maybe it might be a good idea for me to ask someone else what they did with this problem, if anyone actually got this one. So. What, is, what actually happened here? So you do the large draws, mm -hmm. and then you end up with it. So what does cosine has become under y straws? 1 minus u squared over 1 plus u squared. And dx is 2 over 1 plus u squared. That's 2 <coughs> over, take the 1 plus u squared times the 4, you get 4 plus 4 u squared. This plus times that. 1 minus u squared. 1 minus u squared. So now you have 3 u squared plus 5. Plus 5. You. Okay. Did you get up to that point? Okay, what do we do from here? Uh, 5t squared equals 3u squared. 5t squared Your equals substitution, 5t squared equals 3u squared. 5t squared equals 3u squared? Yeah, then, like, Oh, I see what you're going for. Yeah, the um, arc tent. That's an interesting way to look at it. Um, I don't think I've ever done it that way. Like, I would have, like, factored out the 5 and the 3 and get a fraction. You probably end up... Let's, let's, let's keep going with this. I'm interesting to see where it ends up. Uh, so you basically want to get a common factor of 5, yeah. right? So that it can look like the arc tangent. Uh, so, to find the derivative here, uh, that's 10t dt would be 6u du. <coughs> so, how are you going to get the u du though? You can just write du equals... No, not like that. Uh, it's going to be annoying to see that. U, U equals square root 5t over square root 3. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I felt hopeful for a while, but no. Yeah, that, that U there is going to be annoying. Um, I think a, a nicer way to do it is just to actually, first of all, you would think of this as square root of 3, U all squared, right, which would be the first step, but then you realize uh, that looks almost like an arc tangent because you have this this formula memorized. <coughs> so you know that, oh man, this is super close on an arc tangent. Um, and the radical 3 isn't a problem because you can just actually do a substitution and divide out that radical 3. But the fact that there's a 5 here instead of a 1, that's a problem. But it's actually not that much of a problem. All you have to do is factor out the 5. So that's 2 fifths. <coughs> Now it's radical 3u squared over 5 plus 1. And that 5, you can move it inside the square even. So it'll actually be radical 3 over 5u squared plus 1 du. And at this point, I would do a substitute. It's going to work out nicely. t equals this. Then my dt is going to be radical 3 over 5 du, and then I would have radical 5 over 3 dt equals to my du. So this guy just becomes 2 over 5 times radical 5 over radical 3 times 1 over t squared plus 1. How come you can move the 5 inside the radical? Because radical 5 squared is 5. Yeah. Wait, I have a question. Yes. Could you also do trig sub from, from that point? You could. At this point, you could have said radical 3u is equal to radical 5 tangent theta. Okay. And it would have worked out, but I, I kind of avoid trig sub if at all possible. And because it's already kind of so close to this one, just factoring out the constant is actually probably a nicer way to do it. At the end of the day, you would end up with 2 over radical 5, radical 5 over radical 3, times the tangent inverse of t. So 
So it's this is actually five. five. But this would cancel into that, so you get 2 over radical 15 times tangent inverse of. Well, technically, it's, it's radical 3 over 5u, but our u is actually tangent x over 2. Because it's a, it's a wire stress. U is tangent x over two. Sorry, one, one quick question. How do we get the two on the, the numerator? Oh, it's from here. No, not not that one, the other one. Oh wait, never mind. I see, I see. Yeah, this one I just multiplied across and then ultimately I factored them out. Yeah, it's the same two from the dx part. Oh, I see. Alright, so that was uh, yeah, the inverse tan rule is what would have helped us out with that. But it's just a matter of, once you got to here, you're like, eh, it's a square plus a constant. It's almost like an inverse tangent. You can just start factoring out the constants to make it get that plus one, then worry about getting everything inside a square, and then, yeah, So we should like try to avoid like the trick substitution, just try to always like look for. <clears throat> As a, for me, as a matter of personal preference, I only do tricks up if I have to. It tends to be one of the longer methods to work out. And even after I finish, you have to go back to that triangle and convert stuff again. Like, I personally find that annoying. So, um, if I'm worried about doing a trig sub, I probably try to figure out some other way first. And just by knowing that I have a rule that looks like this is probably what I would try. If, if on the other hand, the integral I had was something like, like very similar, but not similar, like that to the 3 over 2, then yeah, trig sub, right? But it's not that, it's, it's just this. Don't need trig sub. Right? So I, I'd really only use a trig sub if I had to. And even if this were a square root of that, then yes, trig sub, right? But it's completely rational and it's super close to a rule that I already know. I'm not gonna go through a trig sub. I think it makes it more complicated. I just factor out constants to get it to fit some rule that I already know. And that's less back substitution. Because there's already a second back substitution I have to do here. Once I find it in terms of u, I still have to go back and the tangent is just too much. So you would get the same answer using a trick substitution at this point, but I, I think it's, it's kind of overkill. Right. Right, thank you. Another topic. So we're in the second phase of the class. We're going to talk about uh, sequences and series. So that's what chapter 11 is about. 11.1 um, is the section on sequences. Which, this one should be, there are a couple bonus problems on sequences on the, the test, and I mean, by the end of today, it should be easy for you to actually get those bonus problems after. Even if you had no idea what to do before today, after today's class, you should be able to do this, because it's actually not that complicated. So, 11.1. Uh, sequences, we're going to kind of go through quickly. There's a lot of important <laughs> things you need to know about sequences, but the series is actually the more important part. Um, Pretty much everything we're going to learn about sequences, we're kind of doing it to help us apply that to series. So series is the really thing we're after, but we need to understand sequences um, in order to get to series. So that being said, let's just actually go through the basics of sequences. So what is a sequence? Here's a fuzzy definition, meaning not a mathematically rigorous one, um, but it should give you an idea of what a sequence is. It is just... Uh, a list of numbers. You can think of more generally as mathematical objects, but a list of numbers in a definite order. All right, so, example, you can have minus 1 and 3 and 7 and 11. 
So there's a list of numbers. I can have another number. It's like zero, <coughs> one, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen, etc. Right? So these are a list. Now they are in a definite order. There was something in my there was a rule in my head while I was writing these down that could actually generate the guys here. Now this one, what you might have seen, notice the rule is it was just to add four each time. Start at minus one, keep adding four. Right? Now, in general, that's something that's called an arithmetic sequence, which you would have heard about in high school. I'm not going to really test it directly on that. But there's a definite order to how I'm writing things down. At this point, you'll notice that the list actually stops, right? meaning this is a sequence of four things. There are four numbers in the sequence. <laughs> Such a sequence is called a finite sequence because it actually ends. There's a finite number of things in the list. So this I would call a finite sequence. Now this one, the ellipses, this indicates uh, the pattern continues. So hopefully whatever you notice I was doing from before, um, it just keeps going. And so this is a case of an infinite sequence. But they're both sequence. They are a list of, for which there is a definite order. There is a definite sense of who is first, who is second, who is the third guy, who is the fourth guy, and so on and so forth. You guys recognize this sequence? Fibonacci. Fibonacci sequence, right? There are a lot of people who geek out over that sequence. Right? Fibonacci figured that out when studying rabbit populations, and it turns out many things in our universe actually follow this sequence of numbers. It's kind of crazy. Like it, it literally has some people believing in God. That, that's, how, that's how crazy this sequence is. We're not going to go into that. It's just an example. Um, so a list of numbers in a definite order, we call this a sequence. That's all it is, a list. It's just there's a, there's a specific way that we want to make this list. Um, we can name them. Um, just like we can name functions. In fact, we'll talk about sequences as functions pretty soon. Uh, usually, lowercase letters. With subscripts and brackets. Curly brackets. So, for example, I can say a n is a sequence, and I can talk about something like that. So I'm saying this is an example of an infinite sequence. So this is just an actual list. So what this, when I write that down, what you should imagine I'm talking about is there's just a list of things that starts at one. So like a1, then a2, then a3, then a4, and it keeps going forever to infinity, right? So the n equals 1, this tells you the starting position. And the guy up here tells you the ending position. Okay. So, um, <laughs> For example, the above two examples. I could have said my a n is equal to minus 1 plus 4 n, and that goes on for uh, n equals 0, 1, 2. So I can actually describe this list starting at n equals 0, stopping at n equals 3, and that would generate by this formula. So I can tell you a formula of how I'm coming up with the dice, and I can generate a sequence. Now the moment I start at a number and stop at a number, that tells you it's a finite sequence. This particular one has four things in it. There's a zeroth term, and a first term, and a second term, and a third term. Right? Um, and the the other one, the Fibonacci sequence, it's 
So the sequence 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8. The rule is um, the first term is 0, the second term is 1, and then all future terms are just the sum of the previous two terms. So my a3 is going to be a2 plus a1, my a4 is going to be a3 plus a2, my, my a8 is going to be a7 plus a6, and so on and so forth. This, this way of defining a sequence, this is called a recursive definition. It's when you de define a rule based on previously established guys. So this is a recursive definition. Right? So the rule depends on some initial initially <coughs> known values. And then other guys computed based on that. that would actually generate the sequence. So I can talk about this, and then the sequence a n, starting from n equals 1 to infinity, will be the list 0, 1, 1, 2, 7. Don't have to know, I'm not going to quiz you on recursive versus a regular definition. So we can define them in terms of formulas, we can define them in recursively, or we can just define them based on some list where it's easy for the reader to pick up on a pattern. But a list in a definite order, this is a sequence. Um, now, another way to look at a sequence is as a function whose domain is the natural numbers, which may include 0, may include start at 1. Um, some people go into a heated debate over whether 0 is a natural number or not. We're not going to worry about it. Um, it'll be obvious when I'm writing stuff down. Um, so, example. Fibonacci sequence. That's how you spell Fibonacci. Right. Instead of thinking of this as a particular list or as this particular definition, I can just think of it as a function where the domain is just the set of natural numbers. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, keep going. And the codomain is just the members of the list. So 1 gets mapped to 0, 2 gets mapped to 1. 3 gets mapped to 1, 4 gets mapped to 2, 5 gets mapped to 3, etc. So I can just think of it as a function of connecting domain and range elements. And this is a more mathematically rigorous way to think of a sequence. Just think of it as a function. But we're always plugging in 1, 2, 3, and then we're creating a list, right? So 1 will always connect to the term A1, 2 will always connect to the term A2. 3 would always connect to the term E3, and so on and so forth. And, yeah. So that's another thing I guess you can write. These things here, these are called the terms of the sequence. So if I say the, the fifth term, I'm talking about A sub 5. It's going to be the guy who 5 gets connected to. Or if I'm just writing out a list, the fifth guy in the list. That's just a sequence. It's just a list of things. There's a definite order. You can think of it as a list in a definite order. Or you can think of it as a function. Depending on the context, one way might be uh, more useful than the other. Now, there is the idea of the convergence of a sequence. Now, we 
say the sequence, but this only applies to infinite sequences, so let me write that down. We say the infinite sequence converges to L if the limit as n approaches infinity of whatever formula I can use to describe that guy is equal to L, where L is a real number. Otherwise, we say the sequence diverges. The difference between converse and diverges of a sequence, it's a, it's a limit problem, right? Find the limit. Now, for sequences, it is always <coughs> the limit as n approaches infinity. It doesn't actually make sense to take any other limit if you're talking about a sequence. Um, so, you may write just lim a sub n because the n approaches infinity is implied. I don't have to write it down all the time. Or, you can just write a n and arrow l so I can just write that can be a lazy because we're always going to be taking the infinite limit. And why can we not approach anything else? Well, we can't get close to any finite number. <coughs> So, if I look at, for example, I have a sequence a n, from n goes from 1 to infinity, defined <coughs> by my a n equals 1 over n. Notice what's actually happening here. I can actually think of this as a function, but the thing is the domain isn't all real numbers. It is actually just uh, the integers, so uh, positive integers. So, there's a 1, and that guy outputs at 1. And then there's a 2, and that guy outputs at a half. And then there's a 3, and that guy outputs at a third. And then 4 <coughs> outputs at a fourth, and then 5, and so on. Right? So notice here, if you were to graph what a sequence would look like, it's just a bunch of isolated dots, which means how can I take the limit as I'm approaching 2? I can't, right? Limits have to get arbitrarily close to a point. You can't actually do that. But one thing I can do is I can talk about the trend of the sequence, right? I can see as time goes on, where are the, these points? What is the output that they're all approaching? And this is the idea of convergence, right? So I can talk about the sequence converging <coughs> So at any given point, I can't talk about getting close to that point because there's always going to be a gap of one unit wide. A limit just does not apply. Limits need to get close. Right? But you can talk about a trend, and that is talking about the convergence of the sequence. Right? And this one, you might ask, what does this sequence converge to? And it's actually just a matter of taking the limit. Basically, if I want to know what does this converge to, I would just take the limit of a n. And it's always going to be as n approaches infinity. So that's the limit of 1 over n. And by now we should know that's 0. Right? 
That's it. So I can say, we can say, a n approaches zero, or a n converges to zero. That's it. That's basically it. So now you guys actually know how to do the bonus of the problem. That's it. I ask you, what does the sequence converge to? Take the limit. And of course, all your limit rules would apply. So if you know L'Hopital's rule, it might come into effect. You know, any all your limit rules will still apply. And I'll actually write down specifically what you can assume works for sequences. But that's basically it. So I can talk about uh, just some other examples, just to give you some variety here. If I talk about the sequence a n <coughs> given by a n equals n, that's another sequence. If I were to draft its picture, right, one would plot to one, two would plot to two, three would plot to three, etc. Right, so I just get a bunch of ascending dots here. So I can't approach any di distinct point, but I can clearly see that there's a trend happening here. And it seems that the outputs just keep getting larger and larger and larger. So I can say here, if I look at the limit of a n, that's just going to be the limit of n. Well, that's infinity. So in other words, I would say here a n diverges. Of course, to infinity, but you don't have to write that. So as long as it does, the limit isn't a positive, not, not positive, as long as the limit isn't a real number, we say it diverges. So if it goes off to infinity, diverges. Right? This one went to actual number, converges. It's possible for a sequence to have neither of these behaviors. So for example, I can talk about the sequence a n <coughs> given by a n equals minus 1 to the n. Now, what does that actually look like? Well, that basically says a1 is going to be minus 1, then a2 is going to be 1, then a3 is going to be minus 1, then a4 is going to be 1, etc. If I were to graph a picture of this, okay, so at 1, we're minus 1, then at 2, or positive one, then minus one, then positive one, then minus one, and so on and so forth. So there's a trend on the even number terms of outputting one, and there's a trend on the odd number terms of outputting minus one. Now if you ask, what does this converge to? Is there some output that it settles at? The answer would be no. It just keeps bouncing up and down between these two points that are two units away from each other. So here, I can just simply say, if I were to take the limit of a n, this is just the limit of minus 1 to the n, and this one just does not exist. It does not approach anything. It doesn't approach infinity or negative infinity or a number. It just keeps bouncing up and down between two distinct numbers. So I can also say here, a n diverges. Yes? So using that, using that same graph, we could say like the trig functions, they just diverge, right? You mean if I think of the trig function as like a sequence, like yeah. cosine n? Yeah. <coughs> then yeah, so that would bounce up and down. Yeah. Would diverge, right? all, the, all the trig functions would actually diverge. Um, in fact, if I look at the sequence, <coughs> something like uh, a n equals the cosine of n pi, then this sequence is actually exactly equal to that sequence. Because cosine of pi is minus 1, cosine 2 pi is plus 1, cosine 3. Right, so this guy, will, the list will actually list. So it's just important for you to know, you're not thinking of this as a curve that does this, right? Because that's no longer true. Right, you're thinking of it as well, that curve you can think of as the trend, but the actual sequence is just specific points along this trend that are isolated. 
And, but, yeah, so the trig functions in general are going to diverge unless you kind of modify them some way to force them to behave a certain way. Like if uh, this sequence, sine of n pi, that's actually a convergent sequence because that literally outputs zero all the time. That's essentially zero. Right? At all points, it's going to be zero, 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 zero. What's the trend here? It's zero. It's always zero. Yeah. Question: What if it tends to a, a converge sequence? Come again? What if uh, that one times to uh, times a converge sequence? Oh well, it would depend. It would depend on the sequence, actually. So, for example, if I take a n equals just one, it's always the sequence one, right? And then I take b n to be minus one to the n, and then I create the sequence a n times b n. What would that create? Well, it actually just creates a divergent sequence. Versus if I let my a n equals sine of n pi, and my b n equals minus one to the n, what would the sequence a n b n look like? Well, it's going to be minus one to the n times sine of n pi, but that's still always just zero. So this one would converge. This one diverges. So yeah, the multiplication of sequences, uh, that's different. That's something you have to take uh, one at a time. Um, that being said, there are some rules that we know about sequences in terms of convergence here. Properties of convergent sequences. A n and B n are convergent sequences. And C is a constant. Then it turns out, luckily for us, all the familiar limit rules still actually apply. Meaning, if I want to find what would a constant times the sequence converge to, well, it converges to the constant times the convergence point of the sequence. Or what would a sum of sequences converge to? Well, it converges to the sum of the convergences. Um, if I multiply two sequences, what does that converge to? Well, it converges to the product of the convergences. Right? Now, if both of these go to a number, then the product is going to go to a number. If one of these happen to diverge, as in this example here, then it's kind of, you deal with that on a case-by-case -case basis. You won't know what happens in general. But as long as they're all convergent, uh, they actually, sequences are pretty nice. They distribute across sums, they distribute across products, you can factor out constants, they distribute across divisions. So if I want to find what does the division of these two sequences converge to, well, it converges to the division of the convergences, provided, of course, you're not dividing by zero. If I have a sequence and I raise it to a positive number, what does that converge to? Well, whatever the convergence was before, raise that to the number. So they actually behave nicely, right? They, they obey all the limit laws, it turns out. The only difference is the limit you're thinking about is always the infinite limit, limit at infinity. Right? That's the only difference with sequences. But as far as limits are concerned, they behave just as regular limits would. So all those familiar limit properties that you know of work out. Um, L'Hopital's rules also works. For those of you who forgot what L'Hopital rule says, it's just something that says if you're looking at the limit of 
one function divided by another function equals, and you get something like infinity over infinity, or zero over zero, meaning both functions are either blowing up, could, could be positive or negative, or both functions are going close to zero, then I can take that limit by differentiating the top and bottom separately. If they exist. So as long as this uh, limit actually exists, it's always going to give you the same answer as that one. So I can talk about a more complicated looking sequence. So maybe like a typical example here. Example, um, say a n equals ln of n over n. I can ask, does a n converge? Well, what I can do is look at the limit of a n. That's going to be the limit of ln n over ln. I would notice that as n goes to infinity, the top is going to go off to infinity. As n goes to infinity, the bottom goes off to infinity. And I can actually think of this as differentiate the top, differentiate the bottom. And this limit is actually going to be the same as that limit. I know this one actually works out to zero. So the answer would be yes, a n converges to zero. Right. So all your old limit rules apply, L'Hopital's rules still apply, Scott's <coughs> theorem still applies. Squeeze theorem says, in case you forgot, it's a Calc 1 um, definition, it's a theorem. <coughs> so if um, we have a n less than or equal to b n less than or equal to c n, and you have a n converges to L, and at the same time Cn converges to L, then your Bn will converge to L. So the idea is if you have An less than or equal to Bn less than or equal to Cn, you can take the limits of everybody. This guy becomes L. that guy becomes L. And so the limit of Bn is less than or equal to L and at the same time greater than or equal to L kind of means it has to be L. So squeeze theorem is still a thing. Um, so if I were to ask you something like uh, An equals sine n over n, does An converge? Um, well, we know that our sine of n is going to be between minus 1 and 1, which means you can divide everyone by n. n is a positive number <coughs> because it's going to be 1 or larger. And so the inequality signs remain the same. Then what I can do is I can take the limit of everybody. Notice what that means is that 0 is going to be less than or equal to the limit of sine n over n, which is less than or equal to the limit of 0. And so we can conclude 
that the limit of sine n over n equals zero by a squeeze theorem. So the answer is yes, a n converges to zero. So again, these are all familiar things. I just want to jog your memory on these. L'Hopital's rule, squeeze theorem, everything you remember about limits, they're kind of the same. Um, the properties work out the same with sequences. Um, the only difference is you're always going to infinity for your limit, so that's one thing to pay attention to. It's always the limit as you're approaching infinity, because with a sequence it does make sense to approach anything else. Because really all points are isolated. You can really only talk about trends as you go up to infinity. absolute values of the terms of a sequence approach zero. Then it turns out the original sequence will approach zero. So here's an example. Suppose I told you a n is a sequence defined by minus 1 to the n over n. Now, if I were to graph that, what would that actually look like? Well, it would start at minus 1. Then, when n is 2, it gives you positive a half. And is three gives you negative a third. And is four gives you positive a fourth. And is five gives you negative a fifth. Then positive a sixth. Then negative one seventh. Right? You'll notice that it's uh, the guys in the top. They're trending like this. And the guys in the bottom. They're trending like this. but you'll notice that they're both actually trending off to zero. So while I'm jumping up and down, I'm kind of eventually settling somewhere. Now, looking at the graph, you might, I mean, looking at the graph, you should be able to tell what that is actually converging to. But another way to look at this is that um, it, it's confusing to consider minus 1 to the n over n, uh, what you can do is consider instead the absolute value of minus 1 to the n over n, which is just 1 over n. And we know 1 over n approaches 0. We saw earlier. So this means that the absolute value of our sequence approaches 0. So our original sequence will also approach zero by that theorem. So it turns out this guy, he bounces up and down, yes, but he still actually converges to zero. And from now on, you don't have to prove that. You can just apply this theorem. So sometimes when things are bouncing up and down, you take absolute values to just kind of get it to settle, try to figure out what's going on. If you happen to hit zero, then uh, the original sequence converges to zero. This is going to be important for the future as well. Increasing and decreasing sequences. We say a n 
is increasing if each new term is larger than or equal to the previous term. We say a n is decreasing if each new term is smaller than or equal to the previous term. And just so you know, you can apply calculus here. see if it's positive, or you can take a derivative and see if it's negative. Yeah, we'll stop there. A couple more facts to tell you about sequences, but we'll finish that up tomorrow and start on series. So now you know about sequences and their convergence. Just take the limit, see where it goes to. Alright, I'll see you. Did Liz come in or go? No way. Please clear.